How many of you know it's a mother's prayer to see her children walk in the ways of the Lord? So Danette, keep praying. Don't give up. And Joshua, today is an exciting day as well for you. Today, with God's help, I want to speak to you a message that I've entitled, A Mother's Heart. A Mother's Heart. There's a lot I could say. You know, even when I think of uh, what's written about Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, there are some things, it says that Mary treasured this in her heart. So there are certain things that, you know, you don't have to post on Instagram everything your child does. Um, last night when I was getting ready to go to bed, I saw my youngest, Nathan, and Priscilla, like he was in my spot in the bed, and I was like, what perfect timing, eh? So he can just sleep into Mother's Day with his mom, and he had his arm like around her neck. So I took a picture, and I actually posted it. In saying that, not everything, it has to be public and publicized. And the Bible says Mary treasured these things in her heart. And, and as a mom, there's a deep place, I know, um, of nurturing, of love, and of care. And I also know that this can be a sensitive subject. You already heard a little bit earlier I lost my mom suddenly in a tragic car accident. And there are some of you I know, because we talk, and you say, this is a hard day. And maybe there's someone watching online that you should be in the room and you chose to stay home just because you know all of the feelings and emotions. And I want to encourage you today. The, the, the intent of the Word of God is never to make us feel bad or to look at our lives and say, well, you know, why did I miss out and everyone else is still blessed with a mom? No, no, no. The Word today is meant to bring hope and encouragement. And I also know that there are women in the room, husbands, families, that you haven't been able to have children. I'm also aware of that. Um, and in saying that, I'm grateful for every single woman that is here today, we also have spiritual mothers. And some of you have families and you're still a spiritual mother. Some of you don't have families and you are an amazing spiritual mother. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you've done at Weston and how you love on those that God has brought into your life and the ones that you went and grabbed as well. We're grateful. And so a mother's heart... I want to read to you out of Mark chapter 7. So if you have your Bible, would you stand if you are able? And we stand because we honor God's Word. Sometimes there's a double blessing where it allows the blood to flow again to your feet. Mark chapter 7. And I want to start reading at verse 24 from the New Living Translation. Here's what it says. Then Jesus left Galilee... And went north to the region of Tyre. He didn't want anyone to know which house he was staying in, but he couldn't keep it a secret. Right away, a woman who had heard about him came and fell at his feet. It didn't say she knew him. It says she heard about him. Her little girl was possessed by an evil spirit, and she begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. Since she was a Gentile, very important, born in Syrian Phoenicia, Jesus told her, first I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, that's true, Lord, but even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plates. Good answer, Jesus said. Now go home, for the demon has left your daughter. And when she arrived home, she found her little girl lying quietly in bed, and the demon was gone. Father, I thank you for your word. Your word's already anointed, and I'm just a human trying to do your will. So God, I ask now that you would anoint my mind, my lips, and my heart, that I might speak this message the way you want me to and bring you glory in the midst. Father, thank you that your word never returns void. Let it prosper wherever you send it, as you said it would, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning, church. So it's a very interesting passage of Scripture. It would be pretty standard, except for 
how Jesus responds to this woman. Some of you, your wall shot straight up and you're like, oh, how dare he call her a dog? And, and with God's help, I want to show you why perhaps it's not as offensive as it might sound to our modern ears today. Uh, we live in a world where I can't even look at someone and, and anyways, I don't want to, you, you could use your imagination. Basically, everything is a, a, a careful line you have to walk. And in saying this, Jesus was not wrong either. So I want to break down a bit more of the context so that I think the crux of what Jesus wants us to hear and to learn and to see comes out. But again, we're looking at a mother's heart. And so we're, we're told in verse 24, let me just go back here for a second. It says, Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre. Now, this story is also found in Matthew chapter 15. I encourage you this afternoon or tonight, go and read it, verses 21 to 28 of Matthew 15. And so the journey was about 30 miles for Jesus to get to Tyre. Now Tyre and Sidon were port cities on the Mediterranean Sea north of Israel. Why is that important? Well, both were flourishing with their trades and were very wealthy. So... There is an opportunity for Tyre and Sidon to be proud. And this is what informed them as this, uh, this story develops. They're proud. They're historic Phoenician cities. And there was an air also about them. Now, also in the Old Testament, we see that Tyre and Sidon are mentioned. And in David's day... Tyre had been on friendly terms with Israel. In fact, the king of Tyre builds a palace for David. And if you take time to read it, David, after that act, says, Okay, I guess I really am the king over Israel, as God had wanted him to be. So that was in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 11. You could go back and you could read about it. But soon after, this is in the Old Testament... The city became known for its wickedness. Its king eventually even claimed to be a god. You can read about this in Ezekiel 28, where the Lord brings a charge against Tyre and Sidon for this very thing. And then Jerusalem, when it was destroyed in 586 BC, Tyre rejoiced. Why? Well, they said, our competition in Israel is gone now. Therefore, we could take more of the profits for ourselves. Not the prophet, the man of God who speaks, but monetary profit. And so this is just to give you a glimpse a little bit of Tyre and Sidon, these two cities. And so it's into this evil and materialistic city that Jesus now chooses to leave Galilee and to go in and how many of you know, if Jesus is going to show up, something is bound to happen. If Jesus is going to show up, even though they're not on speaking terms, Israel and Tyre, that something is bound to happen. Now, we know the rest of the story because we already read it. But I want to stop long enough to say this, that even today, I believe Jesus is walking up to your address He's showing up and he is saying something is about to happen. Something good is about to happen. And if he did it then, he's still the same God who's doing it today. And so I want to say Jesus is walking your way. Yes, you came to his house, but I want you to know you can sit in church your whole life and still miss him. But I believe that he is near and he is here. And he, if he's here, then he can do anything if you allow him. And so the Bible tells us, Mark 7, he didn't want anyone to know where he was staying. But the story doesn't stop there. It says, but there's this woman. And where is she from? Tyre. And so she's a Gentile. And that's a very important thing that Mark wants us to note in his gospel. 
It's this time when he's showing up and he's, you know, wanting to stay fairly low key. It's not a crowd that shows up and finds him. The Bible only reveals to us that it's this woman. And so this woman shows up. She's Greek-speaking local woman. And she's begging him to please drive out this evil demon, this spirit that has taken over and possessed my little daughter. And so when Mark is letting us know her address, so to speak, is also wanting his readers to know her political and racial background. And why is this important? It's because Jews and Syrians didn't mix. They didn't talk. They didn't relate with one another. And she's asking him now in verse 27 to cast out this demon from her daughter. What's the title of the sermon today? A Mother's Heart. She shouldn't be the one running up to him. She should be more so saying, why is he here? And, and we want nothing to do with him, perhaps. But it says that when she heard he was there, she ran and fell at his feet. And, and when you read in Matthew 15, she actually calls out to him, as Matthew records it, son of David. So there was a respect in her heart already for this man that she only heard about whom she never met before. You know, some of you are like, like Thomas, unless I see the holes in his hands, I won't believe. Unless I see Jesus do the miracle first, then I can't believe in him. And friend, I'm just here to say that you receive him by faith. It's not show me all the, the tricks and the miracles, and if they're real, then I believe you. The Bible says that when we come to him, we come to him by faith. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so when you seek after him, you will find him if you search for him with all of your heart, it says in Jeremiah 29. And so there's a responsibility that we all have. You, you might have heard, hey, go to Weston, it's a great church. And not because of the people necessarily, although we have great people here. But my prayer is that we are known more so because of our love for Jesus. That as much as we love the music and, and the fellowship, that he is still the main attraction. And he has to be. And so she only heard that he was here and she came running. If it's true, that's the mother's heart. Then nothing else could work. What do I need to do? That's a mother's heart. You know, I was reading a few things online yesterday. I think there, there was a, a post on Instagram and it's like, when there are five people and only four pieces of pie left, it's the mother who says, I don't really like pie anyway. Right, So that the other four pieces can go around. But that's a mother's heart. It's to give, to nurture, to love, to pour out. And as a result, sometimes moms feel the weight of the burden that everything needs to go right. And mom, I'm just here to encourage you today. Don't worry. It, it won't always go right. And it's okay. The pressure is not on your shoulders. You know, we're, you're all human. You're not super moms. And so sometimes we put the pressure and the expectation on ourselves. And so here's this mom with this daughter who's possessed and doesn't know what to do. Probably sought help and could not find it. But I heard of a man. And this man showed up. And so she presents herself to him. And so... Verse 27, she's asking him to cast out a demon from her daughter. And Jesus' response would sound harsh or maybe even unsympathetic to you and me. But Jesus was probably, this is according to the New Bible Commentary, Jesus was probably quoting a popular proverb perhaps. Could be. And so it wasn't news to her knowing that Jews... And, and, and the Gentiles didn't really talk and get along in that way. But then also, in any case, we know this to be true. While Jesus was on earth, his ministry, and he was clear about it, was first to the Jewish people. So she would have also probably understood that. And if you read the account in Matthew 15, it actually says this. Then Jesus said to the woman, verse 24... I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But he didn't stop there. 
because she was persistent in her request. You know, by the way, next week is Pentecost Sunday. And Pentecost Sunday, I encourage you, go home, read Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. And Jesus told his followers to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, which was the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that they would speak in tongues. And this would give them power for what? To be a bold witness. So next week is Pentecost Sunday. But you know what the beautiful thing is? Even though, as Jesus said, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 echoes it. And it says, you will be my witnesses. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses. And listen to the geographical expansion of how the gospel was going to work. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So, so when we hear Jesus in Matthew 15, verse 24, saying, my ministry is to the Jewish people first, it was true. And that's how the gospel started, but it wasn't meant to stop there. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. We're Gentiles, most of us, unless you're Jewish descent. We're Gentiles. I'm grateful yeah. that God wanted the gospel, the good news, to go to the ends of the earth. And that mission, because the church is still here on the earth, we're not done yet. Right? So that's why Pentecost is a big deal. I get boldness through the Holy Spirit to be an effective witness. Now, that's next week. So when Jesus is saying, my ministry is not to you, it's to the children first. This isn't your bread to eat. And he calls her a dog. It's not being derogatory. It's not something left out of left field that Jesus is actually saying. Now, young people, if you speak to your mother like that after church, I'm coming at you. <laughs> Don't do that. But hear, hear me for a second. Another take on what's going on is, is very interesting. Again, Jesus' words, they sound harsh to you and me. But the woman may have recognized them as a wide open opportunity to ask him again and I want to share with you why that might be true when Jesus is he didn't use the term dog in a derogatory or negative sense like you and I would think why well sometimes it was used to refer to Gentiles in that way you dogs you don't belong here you scavengers you don't belong here. You don't touch what's meant to be mine. But that's not the, the term that Jesus is using when he's calling her a dog. Instead, when you look at the Greek, it's little dog or household pet. Now, how many of you have pets? How many of you love your pets? Some of you love them more than you love children, perhaps. I don't know. And so when the picture now in my mind is if this is a household pet, you love the pet, you care for the pet, you take care of the pet. So I want to read to you what Jesus says, but knowing what he's actually saying now, it's not you scavenger, because scavengers don't eat my food, even in my home, but a pet, it's like, here's a little pasta, here's a little, don't give them chocolate, kids. They get sick, dogs. But we do that. I, I see it in my, at my mother-in-law's house all the time. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Don't feed the dogs. But look at what Jesus said. First, verse 27, Mark chapter 7. First, I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Makes sense. Makes sense. But when he's saying dogs in that way and not as scavengers, it's very possible that she saw the open invitation of what Jesus is trying to say and say, you want to take the opportunity? And look at her response. Verse 28, that's true, Lord. But even the dogs under the table, right? Who, no scavenger dog is under your table at dinner time. Catch this. So she's picking up, perhaps, on his cue. And she says, that's true, Lord, but even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps 
from the children's plates. She's saying, I still have access though. Even if the gospel is not meant to reach here yet, you're still giving me an opportunity. And Jesus responds in verse 29 saying, good answer. Good answer. Now go home for the demon has left your daughter. This morning's message is not a complicated message. It's a very simple message. We see a mother and a mother's heart on full display. She finds out that Jesus came near and she says, I don't care what it looks like to anyone else, but if he can do it, then I'm going to go and get what I came here for. And I'm going to get from Jesus what I need for my family, for my daughter. That's a mother's heart. And there are mothers here today, I know you've been contending for your children. You've been standing in the gap. You've been all night prayer watch over your children because they're not home. And, and you don't know where they're at perhaps. Don't quit. Don't stop. I'm here to remind you and to encourage you that you can still have hope and an expectation. Because that's really what she came to Jesus with. A hope that he is who he said who she heard he is, and that he can do what only he can do because no one else could help her daughter. And that's the, the mother's heart that we see on display. Her attitude was expectant and hopeful, not hypersensitive of maybe I'm not supposed to do this. She said, if it's for my daughter, I don't care. And I wonder if there are some women in the house today, some men even in the house, who you're gonna, you don't care about the crowd, you just want to reach Jesus. You're going to come full of faith and you're going to say, God, I need you. Unless you show up, I don't know what else to do. But that's a mother's heart for her children. And Jesus says, good answer. What, what could have been like, I don't know what's going to happen. He says, good answer. Because she knew that he held the keys for what her daughter needed. She knew what she wanted and she believed Jesus could provide it. My question is, do you believe the same this morning? Do you believe the same? Don't just say amen because you're in church. Do you really believe it this morning? Because some of you, maybe you've been walking through some difficult seasons, some difficult circumstances, and, and you haven't seen the breakthrough yet. You haven't seen the light at the end of the tunnel yet. And you're just like, well... I guess this is my lot in life. And I'm here to remind you that Jesus is here. If he walked up to her village, even ahead of time, before the gospel was intended. I mean, he is the living word. So it almost was a prophetic sign of the, the gospel message that was eventually coming to all of the Gentiles. But if he showed up there, why do you think he can't show up here for you in your situation? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is our God. And so I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet this morning. I'm going to ask Megan and Rachel if, if you would come back and join me on the platform. Good answer, Jesus said. What are you coming to Jesus with? Your excuse or your faith? I want, I want him to say, Jonathan, good answer. You know how I pray these days? God, if you said it, I, I'm going to believe it. If you said you could do it, then do it, Lord. I pray his word back to him, and I remind him of what he already said to me. Lord, you said. God, you said. Today is the day of salvation. Lord, you said by your stripes we are healed. You said. Some of us, we, we get the report from the doctor and we let that be or hold a higher weight or a higher standard than God's written word for us. And I'm here to remind you today from this Syrophoenician woman, a great example, who got what, what she needed out of Jesus. Now, he's not some genie in a bottle where, you, you know, it's like you only get three wishes. And if all you've come for is the blessing, 
you're missing out on the most important thing, which is the relationship. When the relationship is right, you get the benefits of all that he has. How do I know? Well, I'm a dad and I have kids. And my kids, they're very good at being persistent in asking. And guess what? My heart is to bless them. But what I desire more as a father, and I'm sure my wife as a mother, is we want the relationship. Sit down. How is your day? How you're doing? What, what are the things that are going through your mind? What are some of the good things that happened today? What are some of the hard things that happened today? And we have an opportunity to build relationship. And today I have a question for you. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? More so than Him giving you what you ask for, the best thing that He can do for you and offer you is the gift of salvation. Because without that, we're all lost. Without that, we have no hope for tomorrow. And so my question to you today is, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And if you don't, I simply want to give you an opportunity to receive Him. The invitation is there, and I'm going to give you that invitation. But Romans chapter 10 says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart God raised them from the dead, you will be saved. That's how you receive the gift of salvation. And what this gift does for you is it not only cleanses me of all of my wrongdoing, of all of my sin, and imputes in me the righteousness of Christ, because on my own, my righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. But once I have Christ as my Lord and Savior, the Bible says God looks at me and sees the righteousness of Christ. And, and salvation is not by works. You can't do a whole bunch of good things and be saved. The Bible says, lest any man boast. But instead, it's the free gift of God. And it's received by faith. So today, if you're here, you know, we have praying mothers and praying spiritual mothers even now. Ain't that right, Weston? That when I give this opportunity for you to receive Christ, there are people praying for you that you would say yes, that you would receive Christ. That's the prayer Donette prayed for Joshua. And this morning, there's an opportunity for you to say yes to Christ. If you're here within the sound of my voice and you've never prayed a simple prayer and asked Jesus to come live inside of you, to be Lord and Savior, what does it mean to be Lord? It means that you're giving Him the keys and the driver's seat of your life. And you're saying, God, I, I'm tired of driving because I don't know where I'm going. And I want you to be the one leading and guiding me. That's what lordship means. It sounds like a top heavy word because it is. And you're saying, Lord, I yield my life to you. What you say now, I will do. Where you go, I will go. And help me to live and to follow you fully all the days of my life. If you're here within the sound of my voice, and there's one of two opportunities. One, it's a first-time decision for Christ. Or number two, you're recommitting, you're rededicating. You're saying, Pastor, I, maybe I've been in church, but in my heart I know I've been very distant. But today I feel the Holy Spirit. And you would likely feel it in your gut, in your belly. And it, it's like this tug and this pull. And it might feel uncomfortable. You're like, what is this? That's the Holy Spirit saying, this is your moment. This is your moment. This is for you. And so all I'm going to ask very simply, I'm going to count to three. And, I, and not to embarrass you, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. But just so I know who's going to pray this prayer and who I'm leading in this prayer. And you say, well, why do you have to count to three? Because you got to choose. And when I count to three, if you're making that decision, there's no doubt anymore. You're deciding even now as I'm speaking, when he counts to three, my hand is shooting up in Jesus' name. It's not emotionalism. I'm simply giving you an opportunity to respond to the word. And God desires relationship. And the Bible, Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father who is in heaven except through me. That means it's by relationship with him. 
There's only one way to heaven, and it's through a relationship with Jesus. If that's you, on the count of three, without any hyper emotionalism, just slip your hand up. One, two, and three. I see that hand, brother. Thank you. Anyone else? I see those hands at the back. Amen. Anyone else? If you're watching online, you're not excluded. This opportunity is for you as well. Amen. You could put your hands down. And I'm just going to invite you, if, especially if you raised your hands, but I'm going to invite the whole church to pray this. And before we do, I want you to know this. Not, there's nothing special about the words that I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Nothing special. You know what's special? When it comes from your heart. When you mean it from the bottom of your heart, Lord, and you begin to pray, uh, let it come from the soul, the depth of who you are. Because we don't want to just move our lips. We want to mean what we say. And the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Choose this day whom you will serve. So thank you for those who've lifted your hands. Church, would you join us as well and pray this prayer? Repeat this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. But I thank you I'm not leaving the same. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in so doing, I repent of my sin. And I turn to follow you now. And now I believe in my heart that I am a new creation. I receive you now by faith. The old me is dead and gone. And as your word says, everything has been made new. So thank you for making me brand new again. From the inside out, I'll never be the same again. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. And to never turn back. Jesus, I want to follow you fully. All for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we say amen this morning and give thanks to the Lord?